I listed my flip. At that point, so I was about a good $60,000, $70,000 invested in real estate negatively. Like I hadn't made a penny because that first property, again, is sitting here with this orange sticker. And I got to figure this out. So if we minus that, I was probably $100,000 just, just in a hole in real estate. And I listed my flip. I want to say we listed at 9 a.m. in the morning. We went live. By 5 p.m., I was under contract, $20,000 over ass. Hey, what's up, landlords? Welcome to episode number 163 of the Better Than Success podcast. I'm your host, Nicole Purvey, and this episode is amazing. We are going to be talking to one of the Women in Real Estate Summit speakers. She's going to be telling you about her journey, about how she went from working in the prisons to becoming a full-time investor literally in like a year and a half. For real. She Did I also mention that she also is a widow? So... In this whole story, we'll find out how she became a widow to quitting her nine to five and becoming a full-time investor and general contractor. So her story is amazing. And if she can do it, you can do it too. So make sure you listen to this episode in its entirety. I want to tell you guys, you may know, most of you should know that the Women in Real Estate Summit is coming up. The fourth Women in Real Estate Summit is coming up on November 11th in Philadelphia. Now, here's the thing. In order to prepare you guys for the actual summit, we're doing a couple of things. One, we're doing this podcast so you guys can get to know the speakers intimately, but also starting Thursday of this week, as of this episode going out, we're going to start the prerequisite work preparing you for the Women in Real Estate Summit. So all of the ticket holders will be able to access the prerequisite work for the Women in Real Estate Summit. I don't want anyone coming there completely ignorant about real estate. I want you to have some basic stuff in place, like how to tell the difference between a good deal and a bad deal, like actually how to analyze deals. Hey, I found the deal. What's next? How to actually put a property under contract and get it to the closing table. Like, I don't want to talk about any of the basic stuff. I want to get down to the nitty gritty so you guys can actually pull the trigger and buy some deals at the Wire Summit 2023. So get your ticket so that... On Thursday, you can have access to the prerequisite work so you can be prepared for Wire Summit. So here's what I want you to do. Get a discount for the ticket. Go to wiresummitdiscount.com and you will be able to get a discount for the ticket. And then right after you sign up to get that discount, you'll be navigated to the actual Wire Summit ticket page and you can get your ticket and secure your spot. Okay. All right. Let me read off my guest bio today so we can get right into this interview. Camille Parasol is a resilient entrepreneur who overcame significant obstacles from being abandoned as a child to experiencing teenage pregnancy and widowhood due to gun violence. She has successfully revived Stone and Renovations Construction and Lead Company, offering construction, restoration, and environmental testing services. Camille's real estate journey, which began in 2016, has led her to build a portfolio with RNC Legacies, Inc., securing wealth for future Future generations while supporting fellow entrepreneurs through her consulting firm, Legacy Builders Management and Consulting LLC. Everyone, welcome Camille to the show. Hey everyone, welcome to the Better Than Success podcast. Nikki, I'm so happy you decided to reboot the podcast. I love it. It's been going for a minute. I'm excited to be a part of it as well. Thank you. Why is it going to be everything? It is going to be everything. I cannot wait. I really can't wait. We're like almost a month away, uh, over a little over a month away. Can I? A little over a month. Right there. So just FYI, everyone, Camille is actually my real life friend. We we, we (laughs) scheduled this 30 minutes ago. We had 30 minute girlfriend (laughs) chat. (laughs) And then she's coming to visit me this weekend out in LA. So um, yeah, (laughs) just want to let y'all know y'all going to get in on to some uh Y'all gonna get behind the scenes of some girlfriend chat, girlfriend real estate chat. Because when you're my friend, it's not just all personal stuff. We also got to talk business too. Always, always. So, um, Camille, I just read off your bio. Why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself in your own words? Um. Well, again, I am everything real estate. If you listen to my bio when Nikki read it, she touched here. I do construction. I do environmental testing. I have a large portfolio in Philadelphia. And I also help other entrepreneurs um, grow their business as well as their legacy. That's my main focus and love. I go really, really hard in every aspect of all of my businesses. But my main agenda is to help other people be who they need to be 
to define what wealth means to them, create it, maintain that wealth, and then make sure that it's transferable through other generations or whatever they decide they want to do with it. But we all know that any good business is something that can be sold or, or passed down. So that's always my main goal when I say, okay, well, what is it that you want to do? So every business that I have, my main, the main thing for me is to make sure that it's transferable to my children. If they say, I don't want to do real estate, then okay, it's going to still provide means of income and wealth for them, whether they sell the whole portfolio, rent it out, put it in a manager's hand, an executive, whatever they do, we have a plan. So that's that. been shortcoming. I love that. That's so important. People would just be setting up these businesses mm -hmm. and not thinking about the actual legacy of it all. So, exactly. um, yes, that's massively important. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But I do want to talk about how you got here, right? Like, especially Black women in real estate, mm -hmm. the value is in the story because most of us don't come from real estate. And so, like, to just pull our boot pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and just say, ah, I got a seven figure real estate portfolio was a big deal. <laughs> so let's talk about how you got here. It was a long road, but I promise you, it feels like it just happened and I just got started. Um, I've always wanted to be in real estate. My father, he raised me with a single father, contractor, entrepreneur. So I've always been on a construction site, like literally. I've been on a construction site since probably in a stroller or something because it was no babysitter. My grandma was like, yeah, OK, you better say go with you, figure it out. So I was always there. So I've always had my eye in different things. And I come from a family of home ownership. But growing up in North Philly, I learned that home ownership wasn't something that was plentiful and um, to everybody in my community. Not only did people not own their homes, they're, they rented their homes from non-Black people, non-community members. And they weren't up to par. People will always come to my house and be like, wow, you have a nice house. And I'm like, for real? For real? You know, I, what's just so I was just having a conversation with my mom about this. Um, she was telling me about, I can't remember what she was talking about, somebody's house being a mess. Mm -hmm. And I was like, mom, you don't realize. And I learned this when I started, start first started doing wholesale. And I thought, I mean, first, first started doing mm -hmm. real estate. And I thought I was going to be a wholesaler. And I used to go out with Jabbar. And look at these how look at these houses. You don't realize how most people's houses mm -hmm. are off the chain. Yes, off the chain. So if you got a clean house, you probably in the top. I don't know. I would guess just you probably in the top thirty percentile. If you just got a clean house, just starting here. Mm -hmm. But this went deeper than just being clean. It was like leaks and stuff like this. And how I started entering a lot of these people's homes was my dad was doing work for them. And I heard my dad say one time, like, well, you know, you should get your landlord to fix this. It's expensive. And it was like, oh, the landlord is not going to come. So my mom, like, what's the landlord? And then I started putting it together that that's the little lady, the little, um, you know, white lady that comes around once a month. And not going, you know, she literally pulled up, parked, and she had like four or five houses on the street that I grew up on. And all of these houses, I'm, they were in disarray, like literally from stuff just missing routine maintenance over years and years and years. And when I say over years and years and years, I mean, these are houses where my grandmother was friends with these older women and they raised their children together. So my dad grew up with their children. And now I was growing up with the grandchildren, with the third generation who's been renting, to, renting these properties. So I'm like, wait a minute. All I got to do is buy a house and somebody will move in and stay for 30, 40, 50 years and pay me rent. And they really not going to require that much. Like I could do this BS that people not doing. It's just the basic. Stuff. They're going to make it their home. They're only call me like when the roof is falling in. And if I do routine maintenance, I don't have to let the roof fall in. So they really don't never got to call me. Hmm. I love the sound of that. <laughs> and I could work <laughs> <laughs> once a month, like literally. Now with technology, I really don't even have to work once a month because people pay through my portal. Like, hmm. I love this idea. So that was like little middle school age Camille and my brain started growing at the age of 16 when I got ready to graduate high school I asked my family to give me their family the family house you know the great grandma my house big house everybody didn't live through there at that time no one was living there it was falling apart and everybody laughed at my vision my vision was let me stay here 
I'm going to live in this house. I'm going to fix it up while I occupy it. I'm not paying rent anywhere and I'm going to save money and I'm going to buy me an investment property. And this is before house hacking was a thing. This is back in like 2002. Yeah, 2002. There was no house hacking back then. But in my mind, I knew that this could be a thing. If I could stay here and save my money, I could do it. Family laughed at me. Absolutely not. You're not going to do that. You're whatever. Go find you a nice job with a pension. So, okay, family, y'all laughed at me. I still moved out, of course. I'm always going to be Camille and do, you know, as I please. And that meant moving out but finding my own. It made my journey a little harder, but I still got there and it made it much more appreciatory. Um, I moved and had a lot of jobs. I did here. I went to New York. I was a hairstylist and makeup artist. And that just really wasn't for me. I got pregnant, needed benefits. Because I told you I was 16 at this point. So I was somewhere falsifying some something so I could get this job. But um, I needed benefits at that point. My husband, you know, was still living in the world. And he didn't have any benefits. But I'm about to have his baby. And we have to think for the future. We have to plan out. So not only did I get a job, I think that's when I started driving a school bus where I had medical benefits, it was like, okay, we need life insurance. And I'm just a little girl from North Philly, still don't know too much, but I know enough to find out what are the different types of life insurances. At that time, I purchased um, whole life and term. I got a mixture of it. This is 17-year-old Camille at this point when I was pregnant. Did that, um, you know, kept going, say did the school bus. That really wasn't for me. It cut into my hair time, my money time. I said, well, we want to be messing with my money and what I'm earning. I need to be earning more. This is not enough. I never was able to just stay and say this is enough. I um, took the test for the prison, started working at the prison. I accelerated in my career there, stayed there for several years. And remember, I told you this was my grandma's, you know, antidote and dream. Just go get you a good city job. I had a city job at that as point. As a officer. Correct. As a correctional mm-hmm. professional. It's because I did many things there besides being an officer. Um, I was a teacher. I went into the community and opened up programs to help people um, return to citizens, see who we need, who they um, who they needed to be, and learn the skills that they needed to be in the community as well. Um, so after that, it was like, okay, what do I want to do now? My husband was in the city. I'm in the city. The same house that I asked for initially. 10 years prior, man was on sheriff cell, falling apart being near. So I said, hey, can I have it now? And I still got laughed at. And they laughed and said, well, sure, I'll, you can have it, but you got to pay X, Y, and Z. All this stuff is old on there. And I'm like, okay, I'll figure it out. And I talked to my husband. And he wasn't really in a real estate mindset at that point, but he understood my determination and he saw a little part of my vision and he supported me wholeheartedly. And we saved that house from sheriff's cell and it's like I had to call this person and that person. And I think maybe that's when I did maybe my first little bit of overtime because the city required a nice chunk of money down to take it off the sheriff's cell list. So we got this property, really don't know what to do with it. So now I'm in my bag, I'm researching, I'm learning, I'm talking to everybody who I know who said they did a little piece of real estate. And even though they might not have been the landlord that I wanted to be, I still took what they had to give me because one thing, they had longevity in the game. I knew owners that owned properties for 30 years, 30 and 40 years, they owned these properties and they might didn't do much and they weren't really, they were cash flowing because they owned them outright, but they weren't maximizing the rents that they was able to get. So I'm just learning, I'm learning, and now I'm taking classes and I'm spending money and just putting money out there to learn more about real estate. I wasn't, I didn't buy anything else. And then um, a family friend passed away. He had a property. Nobody wanted this house. It was really, really well maintained. He was the type of person that um, as soon as he got a bill in the mail, he paid it. The, the roofer said, you know, you got to get a touch up every three years. Every 36 months, so at 34 months, he was calling the roof back, the roof back, come touch it up, because this is what you said has to be done. So I already knew his mindset and um, how he maintains his home, but it had a mortgage on here. So I'm talking to the mortgage company, talking to the mortgage company. His family signed me over the house. You know, we made an agreement, 
signed over the deed to me, but it still had this mortgage on there. So I went back and forth with the mortgage company for almost two years to where the lady who had his file, she became my friend. I would call her and go, hey, Camille. Like literally, she knew my voice. And I eventually, you know, um, made it became to an agreeable arrangement, something I could afford. And I, I paid that off and I I invested in myself. Literally, I bet on myself. I leveraged my personal credit to purchase this property to pay because I had to pay off the bank in full with no payment plans under there. It was like, give me, you will agree at a number. I need this whole check right now. Paid them that. So now we have this second property. And my husband and I, we did a lot of overtime and it took us a lot, a lot of time. And we did it. My dad helped us. My kids helped us. My daughter went to school um, like five minutes from there. And literally at the school, she knew we were going to grad street to work. I was 11 to seven, but I was determined. I believed in myself and I knew not only were outside people looking at me who grew up with me and said, you know, Camille was always just an overachiever. She was this, she was that. I knew everybody was watching, but not just them, the people who should have, who I felt like should have been supporting me and rooting for me. They were waiting for me to fall on my face as well. Y'all know I absolutely can't let that happen. So I'm going hard, like pedal to the metal, all angles. Over time, it will be my shift over time, the house. And then I'm still doing everything for the kids because if we're not raising well-rounded children and we're not devoting our time into our children, what are we doing all this grind for? We cannot pass the wealth into them. Right. So the property finally gets done, y'all. Two years later, we done. But guess what? COVID. Real estate is shut down. Can't put nothing on the market. Oh, crap. Because I've leveraged my credit. Exactly. I leveraged my credit. I'm burnt out. Like, I'm burnt out. I was so happy to get to this finish line. I didn't know what to do. So where I was sitting, sitting, waiting. I mean, like, they shut it down like the day before the photographer was coming to take the pictures for us to go live. Yeah. It was like literally every month, like, all right, I'll be figuring this out because we had the end of the project now. So everything is on my credit cards. Everything, yeah, I'm I'm leveraged to the max. Like, what we will do, what we will do. Not so we can't do anything. Everything shut down. So then they finally said, you know, we could do, what was it, um, virtual showings and stuff like that. So, all right, cool. We ready. We were scheduled for two days later. We scheduled for April 10th for that. April 8th, my mother-in-law passed away and my husband was murdered. It was murdered on the same day? So she died at 12.45 a.m. He was shot. He, um, They pronounced him at 4.26 p.m. Same day. Same day. I didn't know that part. Yes. Same day. His mom? The, his mom. The only reason why we were outside, because, and of course, you're my girlfriend, so I shared with you, like, he had locked me down because our daughter has an autoimmune immune disease. So he was like, you're not going back in that jail. I'm like, well, babe, I don't work in a jail. I'm now the director of training. I'm in an office somewhere. He's like, yeah, but you're still around those people that's in the jail. Like, you're not going back. So my last conversation with him after leaving, you know, planning his mother's services with his family, I was like, you're right. I'm about to call human resources right now to tell them they got to figure it out. Because I can't come back in here right now. And that was our last conversation. Literally, that's how we hung up the phone. Just for me to get from North Philly up top and get that phone call saying he had been shot. Yeah. Same thing as mine. So now I'm frantically trying to drive and, you know, call his siblings who just lost their mom and tell them he shot in the news I got. And, you know, I always tell everybody, just keep it, keep it being with me. Please don't try to sugarcoat anything and make me figure it out. Tell me exactly what it is. What do I need to know? So the person that called me, he said, sis, is not looking good. Yeah. Same thing. And that shut me down. I was always the strong person throughout life. I was always the person that everybody came to for love, nurturing, support, encouragement, advice, everything. It was always called Camille. She will help you figure it out. At that moment, I was done. I was depleted. 
I let something out that, like, I could still feel it when I had to bury him. I was done. Like, just, just done. And I was that way for several, several months. So we're like, I wasn't left alone or anything. And I'm in bed and my mind was still working up. It was still working. I was hurting. I was hurting. I was sick. But the only thing that pulled me out of that little by little was my mind was still working. Because at the end of the day, I still got these fucking bills to pay. Oh, excuse me, I curse. So I got these bills to pay. <laughs> I got these two little girls that's looking at me. I can't let them see me fall and crumble and not recover. So I'm working like, how can I do this? Like, God, just please, please touch me. Like, that was my prayer every day. Like, just please touch me. Please revive me. Give me what I need. And every day. And one day, I got a phone call from my dad. He said one of his friends called him. And so they put an orange sticker on the door of the first property that we purchased that family house. If anybody don't know, in Philadelphia, orange sticker is a repair or demolish sticker. Repair or demolish. Yeah. I'm like, my God, that's not what I asked you for. That's not what I asked you for. I asked you to give me what I needed to get up. And I didn't know what to do. I called several people. And I'm like, you know what, just sell it. I'm done. So both of them, figure it out. Because I still got this flip sitting over here. Figure it out, y'all. Just leave me alone. I don't want anything to do with it. And um, we listed it on the MLS. And I started getting phone calls. Like, why are y'all calling me? Call the agent. But the agent, little did I know, was deliberately avoiding these phone calls because he didn't want to list it. He did not want it for me. He did not want me to give up. When I tell you he talked to me every day, like he became, I was already in therapy four times a week, but he became my therapist. Do I know the agent? You, you know, you know what? Because he did, then he came to you didn't meet him. Okay. Yeah. And he does wholesaling, like everybody know him in the city. Like I, I give him his whole shout out, Kenzie. Everybody know Kenzie. He was one of the best things that God, or best people that God could have placed in my life. So while I'm saying, God, give me what I need to get up, it was that orange sticker. Because lo and behold, this was the craziest turn of events. Somebody knocked on my door and keep knocking like they the police. So now I'm mad. I'm stopping. I go down there like, what's up? What? It was a man holding $40,000 because he wanted to buy that property. Like, what? Like, what you, you, he just showed me the bag. Like, miss, I don't know. I just wanted it. And the guy not answering the phone. I said, that's not what you do. You do X, Y, and Z. And I settled my steps in my bathrobe, here, like, mad it to the side of my head. And we talked for about two hours. You and a guy. Me and a guy. Me and a guy. And we were still like great, great friends to to that. And I talked to him and talked to him. I didn't even realize that all the money that I had paid learning about real estate and all the time I had devoted, I didn't realize all this was in my head. And so I started talking to him. And it's coming out. And when I got out of bed that day to go open the door, I never got back in it. Figuratively, of course. I never got back in it. Never. Did you sell the it, property to him? Absolutely not. Why would I sell you a piece of junk for $40,000? Why do you want to pay me $40,000 for this piece of junk? That must mean this is worth so much more. Right. So much more. Right. So, nope, I didn't sell it to him. Um, but I did sell my flip. I listed my flip. At that point, um, I was, we had to flip everything. I had invested in the flip. That's everything. So I was about a good sixty, seventy thousand dollars invested in real estate negatively. Like I hadn't made a penny. Not one red cent had I made because that first property, again, is sitting there with this orange sticker. 
and I got to figure this out. So shit, if we minus that, I was probably a hundred thousand dollars just just in a hole in real estate. And I listed my flip. I want to say we listed at nine a.m. in the morning. We went live. By five p.m., I was under contract, twenty thousand dollars over ass. This was that that was the prime time. Like that's when rates were exactly. low. It was on fire. Everybody was, on fire. was just moving around trying to figure out COVID. Trying to figure it out, COVID. Yes. <laughs> just, yeah. Yeah. That's when they had like rates had plummeted. Like when they first right. like we want to shoot it down to no interest dag on it. Like, yeah, it was at that point. Um, and it was like a conventional buyer, not an FHA buyer. So I didn't have to deal with all the FHA requirements and mess. And it was just like, wow, thank you, God, for getting me up. Like, thank you. I think at that point, I had already joined BTS. You know, you know, we have a mutual like, friend. You, you skipped over the BTS portion of the story. <laughs> <laughs> you skipped over the BTS. It's okay, though. <laughs> this is your story. This is a show, but you know. So, and by that time, everybody, while I'm in bed, and I had been, you know, being encouraged to join BTS. For, for a couple years at that point. And it was like, I can't literally, I can't put out not one more penny. Like, I can't do it. And it was like, oh, so good. I was like, yeah, I can't do it. Come to the Wednesday night meeting with me. I can't, I gotta go to this property and work. But it seemed good though. But during that time, um, somebody, a real close friend, I say he's my cousin. He was like, listen, you gotta join this. Call and tell her, I said, give you a discount code. I'm not doing this crap. But I did. And you gave me, I reached out to you. I DM'd you. You sent me a discount code. And I joined. And I was laying to be, I'll be scrolling on the group chat. And even at that, I didn't even realize. You're forgetting the, the Philly Real Estate Week part, part. So wait, I don't think Philly Real Estate Week had that happen, John. That was in the summer. No, you joined. That's when Philly Real Estate Week is in the summer. Yeah. But you joined. I joined, I joined in the spring. Okay, so I joined in the spring. Okay, no way. I didn't miss that part. I didn't get to that part yet. Don't okay. rush the story. Okay, sorry. So, sell the property. I'm still topsy-turvy of like, where's my life going? Do I just pay off all my debt that I incurred and still sell this property? Like, what do I want to do? But I said, you know what? I don't, like, literally, I didn't know. I contacted um, an engineer, my favorite structural engineer, Looney Engineering, and he said, okay, well, you know, this is what you got to do. This is how much it is. And I said, okay. I said, go ahead and do it. And then I was like, you know what? F this. I'm done. This is too much. I can't do it without my husband. I can't do it. It's just me. I can't do it. So I text him back, like, nope, never mind. And so this is when Philly Real Estate Week came up. It was a contest. And it was like a thousand dollars. And that's what I had to pay him was a thousand dollars. So he sent me the invoice and he said, listen, whatever you want to do, just let me know. Whenever you're ready, just let me know. And I won that um, contest. I forgot. So what let me, was tell, let me tell you contest. my side of the story from that. So just FYI, everybody, we do Philly Real Estate Week. Um, we did two in-person. In-person is nine physical events in five days. It's a celebration of real estate in Philadelphia, all about bridging the information gap between uh, policymakers, large investors, and everyday investors and regular everyday homeowners, right? So it's just all about putting information out there. Nobody's got a cheat on the information. So not events in five days. COVID happens. I'm also very, very pregnant at this point. Like very pregnant. The, the, the type of pregnant that you sleep in for 14 hours a day, that time of the pregnancy, okay? So we decided to do a virtual. And I, I already know, like, if you're doing virtual from doing a big in-person event, you got to give people an extra bang for their buck. So we did, we did 20 events in five days. It's 20 virtual events, right? And so what we typically do is towards the end is we'll give away a, um, we, we call it a, a stipend or a grant. We, so we did two grants to people who this will go towards their first property, investing in their first property. So we did like 1,500, 2,500, something like that. It wasn't like, it wasn't more than $5,000. Can't remember what it was. Um, so at the end of it, I literally, I, I'm not exaggerating. It was 100% a random, random situation. Like I, I didn't even host any of the events. 
I had a whole hosting committee. I was in this house in California running Philly Real Estate Week, literally just waking up for like one event. Like, uh. <laughs> so when um, when it came time to give away, it was the very last event. All you had to do was attend one 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 event and then be at that that last event. So I just went to the list of names. Closed my eyes, scrolled my finger. I can't remember. It was very random. Scrolled my <laughs> finger. Camille, you won the thousand dollars, however much it was. <laughs> Camille, you won. And then I think you like DM'd me, messaged me, and was like, "You have no idea. I was yeah. about to give up." Like I literally, I was, I was done. I'm like, I'm not doing this. Like I cannot do it without him. There's nobody there to save me. There. And let me be clear. I had like a husband, husband. Not an absence he has. I had a husband. Like, I had somebody to save me. I could go out and mess some stuff up. And I had somebody, you know, to look at with some puppy dog eyes and he will figure it out. I had somebody to save me. So coming from having somebody to save you to just nobody, just that complete alone feeling like that's something different. That's a major adjustment. So when it came down to like, all right, you know, I sold a flip. I just need to be safe with this money. Just be safe with it. Be safe means pay off your debt, buy a, a like a used vehicle or something, or buy something that's just paid off. Live, be safe because there's nobody to save you. But I took winning that contest was the universe saying it's nobody to save you, but it's so many other things out here to support you through your endeavors, to be there for you, to help hold you up and lift you up when you need it. The God is going to send you whatever you need. It might not look how you think it's going to look. Me, I was used to stuff being wrapped up in pretty pink bows. But for me, it was an orange sticker on the door. <laughs> I like <laughs> it. <laughs> but God will send you what you need. And that thousand dollars, I was like, this is what I need to pay heaven for my plans to submit for my make safe. Like that's that was like the exact number of what I owed him, what I needed. Mm. I said, God, stop playing with me. God likes to play with me, y'all. Y'all gonna learn this. I'll hear my story a little bit more. So we did that. And from there, like I said, I never went back to bed. I was on fire. Like literally, I was on fire. Let me help you, and I'm gonna help you, and I'm gonna help you. And while I'm doing all this, <laughs> and while I'm doing all this helping and supporting others, because I had four months of just built up, built up thoughts and built up energy. Because when you're laying there and you're in a state of grief or depression or whatever it is, it's still there. It's still there. So then I just had an outpour of it. And then my outpour was like, well, you already did a subject too, go. You already saved something from sheriff cell that your grandma got her diaper changed in. What you wanna do next? Well, this hard money thing see I'm kind of hard. I didn't do a lot of research on here. I used hard money, which in our community we all know, you know, once upon a time was frowned upon. It was thought to be predatory. So I'm gonna go buy two properties at the same time. Blanket deal. A lot of people don't even know understand a blanket deal, a blanket transaction. So I did a blanket transaction. I purchased that through share sale. Then it was like another little house, little dirty little crummy house with some best tennis and always the great smelling fried chicken coming up the house. <laughs> <laughs> and I brought that house cash. I said, you know what? I'm going to park something here. So I automatically went into it diversifying my portfolio. And you bought deal from uh, Deal Hunting? Yes. Yes. Actually, that, that was a deal from Deal Hunting. Absolutely. That little dirty house. And tennis so, still there. And still paying on time. In BTS, every Tuesday, we do, it's now called Deal Analysis Lab and Tutoring, where actually Camille runs a lot of them now. <laughs> Look how God works out. So I used to run them. So literally, we just sit and we just analyze deals, go, mm -hmm. go ham and analyze deals. And that's where I bought most of my deals from deal hunting. Absolutely. And then, and the deal, um, once those, I said, damn, why didn't I buy that? It was on deal hunting. Yeah. So and I would when I used to do them, and I'm I know you guys do this as well, but like analyze the deal, be like, oh, this is a good deal. Mm -hmm. You need y'all need to buy it 
Mm-hmm. I would try to sell it to one of the members and we're not getting no commission. Like, hey, you, this would be a good deal for you. I hit the it wholesaler. Right. Like, if, if JoJo don't call you <laughs> by next week, I'm buying this deal, okay? Mm-hmm. If I'm telling JoJo to call you, <laughs> if JoJo don't call you, I'm buying it. And so um, Camille now, she does, um, she she now runs deal hunting, but um, that's what we do as a group. We go on and we analyze deals and it's, I, it's the, it's, yes, it's there to give you deals, but more specifically, the reason that we do it is to give our members practice in analyzing deals. Exactly. It gives them that understanding and that grounding to be able to execute. Because like you said, a lot of people don't look at it, look at it. You don't quite know what you're looking at. You don't quite know what it gets, what it means getting into it. But as we analyze them and analyze them, people that show up every week, they are so comfortable, even when they think they're nervous and they'll hire me to come out. And I don't even got to talk because they've been present. They already know because they've been present. They know what they're looking for. They have an understanding where I'm just filling in little holes and spaces, but they already have it because they show up, they do the work. And that's what's important. You have to show up. You have to do the work. You have to bet on yourself. Amen. You have to find time to put in there and say, you know, I'm going to do this. When I work with people one-on-one, I always say, you got to give yourself 45 minutes a day, not an hour. Even if it's something playing in the background, it's going to resonate. It's going to sit somewhere. Just let it play. You know what's funny? You keep saying bet on yourself. The last episode that we did, it hasn't aired as of recording this. It hasn't aired yet, but it will have aired. um, Our viewers see it. With Lindsay she talked about betting on yourself. We had a whole conversation before we hit recording about betting on yourself. And then we wow. talked about it extensively in, during the podcast. And yeah. so somebody, whoever is watching this right now, mm-hmm. who watched both episodes, this is your sign. Absolutely. God is trying to communicate something to you because when Camille said bet on yourself multiple times. And we talked about it extensively last time. Mm-hmm. And then maybe it's me. I don't know. And to be clear, when I <laughs> when I say bet on yourself, it means take the risk. I don't know, you know, somebody y'all might play craps, y'all might shoot dice, I, I might play the lottery. You're betting on somebody else on the odds. Bet on you, your determination, what you know that you have that's in the core of you that's going to make you go. You know what you're chasing. You know what you what success means to you. You know what wealth means to you. You have to bet on your want, your dire desire to get that and achieve whatever that goal may be to accomplish it. That's what betting on yourself means. It's going to be some sacrifice for this time, money, friends. I don't know what's going friends, y'all. Or people I thought was friends. Like, you, you lose so much. But you know what else I lost? I lost, but I never really had a bad credit score. But I gained a better credit rating. I gained, I went from sixty dollars to $80,000 negative in real estate to being positive seven figures mm-hmm. in this amount of time. That amount of time. That part. My daughter's somewhere in college studying theater, and I'd be like, "Well, what's the return on this investment?" But it's okay. You want to know why? Because she got properties that's paying her stuff. Whatever. It's just like okay. So I've gained not freedom just for myself, but for my children as well. The other they thing I want, of it. I want everybody to realize is that this the short amount of time that all this happened, right? So no, join BTS in 2020. Right now, mm-hmm. recording is 2023. Absolutely. Very short amount of time. And you know what? I didn't purchase anything in 2023 either. But one thing I learned through BTS was strategy. I looked at the market. I, you know, continued to talk to my friends and, you know, associates that were investing for 30 or 40 years and understood got a great understanding of what happened in the market. I understood the trends. I studied the trends of what happened. So when money was really, really cheap and deals were plentiful, I was buying, buying. I was hoarding. Run it up. Run it up. Run it up. Run it up. To literally, I did not rehab my first property with that orange sticker. Of course, I made it safe, but I didn't go through and do that rehab. Y'all want to know why? Because I own it. I don't owe not a dollar one year. So everything that I purchased in that short span of time, I went through there. I'm actually finishing my um, my last one from my inventory that I had sitting that I purchased during the height of COVID, during the height of cheap, cheap money. And the money was so cheap that I was able to sit that property there for two years. I'm like, all right, I'll get to you when I get to you. Because it was so cheap. Literally, when I paid for a mortgage on that property, I probably spent more at Chick-fil-A 
my solid at Chick-fil-A, I think it's $12. I'll probably go to it three times a week. Like, that's literally. why I got, and, and that's why I got Restreet, my Kensington property deck. Yep. Everyone yeah. hates. <laughs> because I yeah. bought it so cheap, I spend more on Uber Eats. Yeah, you can. So, so it's, just like, like, it's just sitting. No one's in it. Yeah. It's just sitting. I waiting yeah. for the market to turn. It'll, it'll, they, they got to do something about that neighborhood. And they will, and they going to. So this is the plug, y'all. If you have money that you can sit and park it and not say, oh, I have to get in there right now, buy in Kensington. If you have money that you can sit and park, that means you're not putting a tenant in there. You're not doing that. You're making it safe. You're going to pay insurance, taxes, your water bill. You're going to have an electric bill. So you have a, a alarm system or something. And let that baby sit. Let it sit. So just to give everybody context, if you've watched this show, you know I talk about my Kensington property a lot because it is um, off the chain. But Kensington is probably the worst neighborhood in Philadelphia. And Philly got issues. Yeah, it is. So um, it's the home of the opioid crisis. It's like the epicenter of it. From what I understand is that the um, whatever that drug, whatever that chemical is in the drug, the fentanyl. Um, fentanyl is the most purest there. So literally, you walk down the street, you have never seen anything like it. It's zombies walking around. You promise you, I promise mm -hmm. you, you've never seen anything like it. So my property, I have a property in the heart of it, and um, it's just it's just sitting there. It's just mm -hmm. sitting there because it's so bad. They have to do something about it. They the neighborhood. They will. And, and, and on, on top of that, the neighborhood is very much so easily accessible. A short train ride to downtown. You, it's actually a really nice train ride. I did it one time. And I came from where I, where I used to live when I lived in Philly. I mm -hmm. lived at Spring Garden in um, Delaware Avenue. So I came from there, said I was going to hop on the train, took the L, and it was, I mean, the actual experience was nice outside of the fact that when I got off, I was ducking and dodging zombies like I was on a Mario game. But um, it's, it's close. It's adjacent to other gentrified areas. Literally, and, it's right um, in the middle. We got an amazing commercial corridor. So, like, once they fix that up, that commercial corridor won't be. Yeah, the walkability high. is going to be 10. It's, it's going to be nice. Yeah, the walkability of that neighborhood is going to be 10. Um, buying Kensington, y'all, if y'all could park money there. Buy. Like I'm telling you, I know a lot of investors from out the country, other states, every investor I know that has like money, money, they don't want anything else in Philadelphia by Kensington. That's crazy. That's crazy. So my little property in Kensington, I'm holding on to that tight. Whatever. And I actually, I have a tenant there my best tenant, like my favorite tenant. If anybody said, come on, we need to um, tour one of your properties right now. You know how like, while I used to work in the jail, the state, they like the state at the door and they used to actually bring them to my housing area. That's how it would be if they say, oh, we gotta go. Like just literally, we outside and I don't know, we go walk in, it's gonna be immaculate. She decorates for every holiday, every everything. So whatever she asks for, she gets. Because mm. if I lose her, I'm going to just board the house up or whatever, put on the grave. Some, because something. I don't want, I, and when we was getting applicants, I didn't want any of the applicants that was yeah. anybody that's willing to live over there right now. You guys, exactly. It's going to be very questionable. <laughs> you be questionable. <laughs> Why do you want to live over here? Yeah, With like the same money and a voucher or a voucher, you could live. Why? Yeah, exactly. So, okay. All right. So, you. this was an amazing story, Camille. <laughs> I didn't know that I learned a lot. I didn't know. I didn't know about your husband's mom. Mm -hmm. um, I learned a lot today. I appreciate it. So, okay. Talk, talk to me a little bit, but before we head out of here, okay. before we start wrapping this up, talk to me a little bit about the services that you offer um, through your business um, in terms of helping people to invest in real estate or achieve their real estate dreams? So through Legacy Builders Management Consultant, I offer um, a variety of consultant services and one from small group coaching to one-on-one -on -one coaching and mentorship. Not only that, 
I'll sit down with people, hopefuls, and come up, help them strategize and come up with a plan. Because you cannot go into real estate and just say, oh, I want to do real estate. Every time somebody calls me or DMs me, text me, say, oh, I want to do real estate. What the heck do you mean you want to do real estate? It's so many different ways to do real estate. Right. It's a million different ways to make money in real estate. It's a million different ways to build wealth in real estate. So I take and I do more like a evaluation of them and I deep dive into their personality and kind of say, okay, you know, you might work well at this. You might do well at that in real estate. What, is, what, what are your time constraints? What do you look like financially? Everybody always assumes that the cheapest way to real estate is wholesaling. It might not really be because that takes a lot of time, mm -hmm. a lot of time to land a viable deal. But you know what? Don't take a lot of time going to Home Depot and getting a weed whacker and offering services, lawn services. That don't take a lot of time. You know what? Don't take a lot of time ordering some smoke detectors, some batteries, filters and saying, hey, landlords, I'm going to go in and do your routine maintenance. This that doesn't take a lot. <laughs> exactly. And that's also one of the services that I offer through Stoner Renovation. I didn't know you did that. You know I'm high. You know, I'm I hire Camille for anything that she <laughs> any of the services she be offering. I didn't know you did that. Yeah, so I do that. Um, I assist people in starting new entities and just making sure their paperwork and documentation is good with the city. I assist people in creating leases. When you lease a when you create a lease for a tenant. You want it to be ironclad. Some things are very generic, but you have other things that's specific to a property. So you have to keep those things in mind too. Like, okay, these are the generic things. So we might have 30 generic clauses, but let's say your property, oh, I'm trying to think of something weird. I have a property that has the weirdest window ever, like the craziest size. And for me to get window treatments for that property, I had to pay like $300. I had to get them custom. And I don't even provide window treatments any longer in any of my properties. But for something like that, you would have to because the tenant will do something jacked up to it and have it looking crazy. So I have a clause here that says, if you mess this up, you will be liable for this amount, starting at this amount. Whereas other things I said, that's generic um, smoke detectors. I'm really, really big on fire prevention and safety. A lot of times these things are overlooked. When we come down to leasing and what we require our tenants to do and expectations, I'm really, really heavy on that. So I go in and like I said, we do the routine maintenance check and that's one of the things that we do. But also in the lease, I'm saying, hey, tenant, I had to pay money for this smoke detector. So if you take it down because you didn't wash your pan or you got some dirty grease and your oven is looking crazy and it's all smoked up and not coming here at any given time for any different, any type of maintenance issue and that smoke detector is down, I'm charging you this. That's in all of my leases. So that's something that's generic, but it's something that's also overlooked by a lot of people. I help um, owners protect themselves. And just from learning different things, you know, that has happened through other investors that I know, I take all that and I pull it in and I say, okay, how can I make this weird now? We're protecting ourselves as well as our tenants. Because we don't want to see anything happen to anybody. We don't want to see a smoke detector down and something catastrophic happens. I know my heart can't take something like that. Right. So just really quickly, Camille's not an attorney, so she help you with your lease, but you're going to have to have you look it over. Attorney, look over. <laughs> I, I can just tell you from my experiences, mm -hmm. some things that I recommend. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, all right, Camille, we have not put in concrete. I haven't told all the speakers what I want them to talk about yet. I know everyone's strengths. So I know what I know what I know. But if you could talk about anything at the Women in Real Estate Summit on November 11th, what would it be? And give us, you know, give us a little bit of meat. If I had to, if I was able to choose what I was going to speak about, it would be about resiliency. Strictly about resiliency. We never know what we um what we have in this we never know how strong we are and i'm not that person to say oh a strong black woman i am against that phrase so far against it because people look at me and that's what they automatically assume no i am woman i am all woman i am fragile and i must be cared for and loved but i promise you i'm resilient and i can overcome anything 
and so can anyone else. That's something that I know. That's something that I can stand on and attest to. You can pop back. I'm no longer that Camille that I was before April 8th, 2020. I'm not her. Like I'm not, by no means. But do I think I'm a better version of me? I don't know. But I know I'm someone that's more confident. I have an understanding that I'm able. I have an understanding that it's okay. We always fall into things where, well, what if this? Well, what if that? So what? It's okay. Whatever it is, it's something that's going to be in the core of you. It might be deep in your in your pinky toe when you go to the nail salon and they digging it out, thinking you got an ink room toenail or something. That might be that part that you need to pop back. I promise you, it's in you. It's just about surrounding yourself with the people that's going to love you and nurture you through whatever you're going through and say, all right, you know, you can stay here. You could be there right now, but you can't stay there. It's mm-hmm. in you. Mm-hmm. And being able to find it, identify it, and then use it to the best of your ability. Can I answer the question? You did. <laughs> you did. I love that. I might be talking about something a little more technical, but that's okay. <laughs> no, I love that. I think, um, you know, the thing about what we do is mm-hmm. um, there is this balance where as an educator influencer, there is this balance that has to be maintained because what we know that people need is different than what they think they need. Mm -hmm. And so most of my content and everything that I do is going to rope you in with the sexy titles. Five ways to buy 500 properties, how to flip a property in three days. I'm, I'm exaggerating, right? But like, I'm going to rope you in with the sex, sexy titles and the technical mm-hmm. stuff because that's absolutely needed. But really, honestly, the thing that people really need is the softer conversations. Mm-hmm. Let's have a serious conversation about resiliency. Let's have a conversation about what it means to be a strong black woman. Let's have a conversation about the guilt and the shame that you're harboring, which is why you're not pulling the trigger on real estate. Let's have a conversation about you believe in something that somebody told you when you was five years old about you not being smart or you Mm -hmm. not being, you know, disciplined. This is why you're not pulling the trigger. It's not the information. It is sometimes. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. For sure. For sure. Like Camille talked about, she did those properties with money out of her pocket, came to BTS and learned about hard money loans. Right. So that allowed her to get busy for the next two years. But busy, 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 busy. But at the end of the day, the conversation is what I need our members and what you guys need to understand is that a lot of the things that's holding you back has nothing to do with a brick in a property, has nothing to do with a back, has nothing to do with barriers. We have so many internal barriers. So many. That we are, we're both dealing with. Even now, I, I actually, um, I'm considering hiring this coach. I had a coaching, uh, like a consultation with her, and she was determined to make me cry. She almost did. If I, I almost, <laughs> I almost cried, but I was just like, I, I, the only reason I didn't want to cry is because I was like, I want to maximize this time that I have with her and like really interviewing her. But, um, and it was all about like challenging my belief system. Mm-hmm. And you know, I'm a crier. <laughs> I'm a cry. I, I would cry. Yeah. I used to be a big crier. I now I'm like it's not even I don't want to cry. I don't got a problem with it. I am just more about maximizing my time. Sometimes you know you look up and you're like I done spent five minutes, ten minutes crying, <laughs> or, just, or just the tears could sing you into a traject a thought trajectory mm-hmm. that is hard to come out of. So I'm you know I'm I'm here for crying, but like I don't cry as easily as I used to. And it's so great. I'm the complete opposite. I used to be like stern and hard and I only cried when I wanted to punch you. But now, no. Nope. Just let it I out. let whatever, whatever it is, I let it come so I can let it go. That's the truth. Yeah, I let it come so I can let it go and keep moving and get back to smiling and living and loving. Amen. Real estate soft life. <laughs> yes. And that's what it's about. I go for it. I go for it every day. And y'all might see me on Instagram. Nicole always laugh about my construction bonnet. I will throw a bonnet on. You will catch me in the mix. But at the same time, when I leave that mix, 
I know how to leave it. When I worked in the jail, I'm, I'm, I've never, I, I'll curse in conversation, but I don't curse at people. I don't yell at people. Like, this is my tone. People always say, talk up, talk up. This is my tone. I commanded respect and nothing but discipline from a hundred murderers and rapists from my soft space, from my womanly space, from all that. So it's a method to it. It's something that maybe you just gain over life. It's, it's, but I really think it's what we demand for ourselves, how we demand to be treated, how we demand to be respected, but also what we give off, what we give off. Nicole calls me old lady over time. She's like, how are you? I'm like, good again. No, you say, you, that ain't what you say. You be like, you be like hey, the way you say, you be like, I'm good and you. I can't even do it. I don't know, who the heck am I talking to? Why you guys sound like old lady like this? I can't even do it. But trust me, it is grandma vibes, granny vibes. And that could be from, look, I used to do that at, a, at 50 doors every day. And I would stop and have this conversation because it's about making the people that you deal with feel human as well. Rather, you know, you're saying, you know, do whatever, because from me talking, from me being a correctional professional, talking to an incarcerated individual, or me being a real estate um, investor and developer, talking to somebody who I want to lower their price for me on this property, talking to a contractor who's just not effing getting it and I want to choke them. But I understand that the best way to do it for me is from this lane because this is my space. I love that. So I live here. I have so much to say about that, about, you know, being feminine, but also effective. Mm-hmm. Um, that That's honestly how I've built my personal brand. And that's always the space that I've come from. Like, I, I am intentional, especially when we when we do in-person events or when we used to do in-person events every single week. Mm-hmm. I was intentional about looking as ladylike as possible mm-hmm. because... Every we people need to know that you don't have to compromise your femininity. And, you know, that's a whole nother conversation about like femininity. What does it mean? Who should how we should feel about it? I'm I'm a woman. I'm proud of it. I am proud of my femininity. And it's something that I work on every day. Mm -hmm. But I say all this to say I want to show people, women specifically, Men, that's a, you know, it's a different conversation, right? Like, because this is not just a woman's brand, right? But women, I want to show them, and I've always wanted to show them, you do not have to compromise your femininity for real estate, for success, no. for your purpose. You don't. You don't. Say, say what you mean and mean what you say and everything else. They're going, it's going to fall in line or they're going to get out of here. Amen. Yep. All right, come on. We got to wrap this up. Okay. Why don't you tell everyone? Um, this was fun, first of all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for being vulnerable. I really, really, really appreciate it. You have no mm-hmm. idea. Um, tell everyone where they can learn about you and where they can find you. Um, everybody, you can always Google me, but the easiest way to get in contact with me is um social media, Instagram, Legacy Builders MC. And I'm I'm Legacy Builders MC on all platforms. If you are thinking about joining BTS, if you definitely know you want to join BTS, which is where you should be, and you want to take advantage of a amazing discount, Camille has a discount for you, code for you. I'm going to give it to you. You can use Camille's discount. Go to joinbts.com and there's a annual option and a monthly option for the annual option. I'll put everything down below in the description, but for the annual option, use Camille two. Everything will be down below. Use that code that gives you 30% off the annual. Then if you want to do the, the monthly option, you get 80% off the sign up fee and just use Camille. That's it. Everything will be down below. And then if you want to just take a membership tour, just go to join BTS. You can learn everything about all the stuff that we do. We only just talked about one of the many things that we do, which is our deal hunting lunch hour. But it's all about getting you guys to invest in your first property in 90 days and increase your net worth by at least $100,000 in a year. It's dummy proof. Cannot mess it up.
That was yeah. uh, just don't come. That's the only way you can mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Camille, thank you so much. I cannot wait to see you this weekend, but also I can't wait to see you on November 11th at the Women in Real Estate Summit. This was a blast. And um, Absolutely. I'm, I'm excited. Like the energy for Wire is just, I've been hyped, I think, for like two, three weeks now. <laughs> it always cancels out for me when I do these big events because it's like the anxiety of like marketing. And, but then I'm, I can't wait. I just can't wait to hit that stage. That's all. That's all. Yes, that's it. I can't wait. <laughs> this was great. Thank you so much. Everybody DM me with any questions about better than success or for any pro tips for your journey. Like I said, right. I'm safe. Bye. Right. Love you. Love you.